Have you ever wondered if there is an Australian version of Warren Buffett? Well, it turns out there is, and his name is Kerr Nielsen. Like Buffett, he started investing at a very early age. Buffett made his first investment when he was 11 years old, and Kerr Nielsen started his first one when he was 13. And although he was born in South Africa, we're claiming him as an Australian, as he spent the majority of his life living in Australia apart from a brief stint in London. So today we're going to be talking about who is Australia's Warren Buffett. So at his peak, he was the ninth richest man in Australia, and he was in the top 500 for the entire world. So I think we need to talk about this guy in a bit more detail. So after doing a bit of a brief stint of working in finance in London, Kerr decided to move back to Australia in 1994, and he started up his own company called Platinum Asset Management. And one of his financial backers was George Soros. Now just cue our oh, conspiracies, 5G, evil money funding. He's gonna pop out any second. Wait for it, wait for it. Did you oh, say George Soros? Yeah, yeah, I did I'll, my I'll research on a YouTube research. video that's similar to what they're actually watching right now. Hey, I've done my research. I'm not unhinged. Oh, whatever. You're probably on George Soros's payroll. Although he was a co-founder, Kerr had to work as the managing director, the executive director, and the chief investment officer. And out of that vast fortune, Kerr owned 2.2 billion of that in US dollars. And I know some of you may be thinking right now, saying, okay, so Australia's Warren Buffett is only worth 2.29 billion, so what? And that is a fair enough question. In, in Australia, I have to point out that we have far less wealth inequality than what exists in the United States. In the United States, the top 20% of the population own 86 of the wealth. Wow, really? Yeah, legit, really. It's not a conspiracy either. That's kind of full However, on. in Australia, the top 20% only own 62% of the wealth. So even although it's a lot of wealth and equality in both countries, Australia is nowhere near at the extreme levels of what the United States is. And in fact, that in itself is probably a pretty interesting topic. I, I might even make a video about that very subject in the future. But if you want to see, you have to subscribe. Before we get into that, we'll talk about Kurt Nielsen's investment style. So was he very similar to Buffett? No. In fact, if I did have to compare him to an iconic American investor, he probably has more in common with Peter Thiel. So, how does he differ? Well, while Warren Buffett looks for value companies and looks for companies with long stable histories and have proven track records and very safe conservative companies, Kurt Nielsen looks for companies that are constantly pushing the envelope of innovation and technology. In fact, he was a very early FANGS investor. And if you don't know what the FANGS is, it's basically Facebook, Amazon, Apple, it's the other order though. Uh, Netflix and Google, and he also invested in Microsoft as well in the early days. And you may be thinking, well, yes, yeah, so what? Many people are investing in the FANGs and in Microsoft nowadays. However, he started doing this in the very, very early days before it was trendy. He's basically like a hipster of investing. So he bought into Microsoft when it was only $22. Today, it is approximately $300 per share. So he did pretty well to pick out of that. But one thing he did have in common with Warren Buffett though, is that the most crucial factor that he looks at before buying a significant investment into a company is to look at who's steering the ship. So both Warren Buffett and Kerr Nielsen make a very big point of researching the CEO or the owner or the entrepreneur behind whatever project they're thinking about getting involved in. They believe that a, a truly visionary entrepreneur with a great vision and a great work ethic and great skills is basically the biggest key to making an investment a good choice. And what specifically is he investing in today? Well, he's focusing his new investments into two primary channels. And so the, one of them is into Asia. But when I say Asia, I'm talking about Asia exclusive of China. He does not have much money invested in Chinese interests, but he does have a lot of money invested in up and comers for other parts of Asia. And the other thing that he's very heavily invested in is still continuing to invest in the FANGs. So the reason that Kerr is so passionate about the FANG stocks is that they all tick his seven point criteria checklist or check boxes or seven ticks or whatever. He has seven requirements that have to be met before he considers buying a share. So what are these seven requirements that he has before he buys into a stock? Number one, they must hold a cornered resource. So as an example, that could be lithium or copper. Two, they enjoy economies of scale. So this is basically any company that produces a digital product because it's very easy to keep up with demand if it comes up. Three, they benefit from network effects. So a great example of this is how Coca-Cola and Pepsi are both networked of the fast food joints to exclusively sell their products there. That is an example of a positive network effect. Four, they offer a product that has a high cost of switching. 
And a real world example of this, if Apple uses switching to Android or Android uses switching to Apple, just the effort of actually switching brands is just too much that most people want to go through, even though money is probably not even a factor in that decision. Five is he wants it to have a powerful brand, because then, then they're sometimes going to allow for them to sell with a bit of a margin. And again, Apple is a bit of an example of this, and also basically any luxury brand. And six and seven, and to me these two are kind of pretty similar, but having number six is to have a constant persistent process of, enha of enhancement. And so obviously the fangs here because it is constantly researching weird and wacky things on technological innovations. And number seven, and I guess Google's the king of this one, is to nurture innovative opportunism. So again, the fangs. So to me, six and seven are pretty similar, but different enough where they get their own checkpoints each. I'll end this video by quoting his advice to all aspiring investors. This advice is you have to be constantly asking the four questions about any investments that you do or do not own. So what are these four questions? Well, the first one is, why am I not selling? So if you own it, you have to justify to yourself, why am I not getting rid of this investment? And then two is, if you don't own it, why am I not buying? Or even furthermore, if you do have part of the investment, why am I not buying more? You have to be able to justify that to yourself as well. Third question is, what would I do if I was a major repricing? Say if it shot tenfold tomorrow or it crashed to 10% of its value, would you still hold on to it or would you get rid of it? And the last one is, is this business franchise going to be bigger in the future than what it is today? So he said you have to ask yourself these four questions about every investment that you're involved in. And that is Australia's Warren Buffett, Kerr Nielsen. And uh, thanks for watching and I don't know how to end videos anymore. Like I, I, I want to be original and say something that you haven't heard before but everyone says don't forget to like and subscribe and but if I do something too weird it's just gonna be silly so what, what is the best way to end the video can you tell me in the comments thanks